Hello, and thanks for tuning in to a Q&A with Dinah Becton, the District Attorney for Contra Costa County. I'm Ted Asregadu, the Public Information Officer for the DA's office. And for the next 25 minutes or so, DA Becton and I are going to talk about some issues related to law enforcement that will be of interest to county residents who are watching this program. First off, thanks for being here, Dinah, and taking the time to talk about some policies and programs that you've implemented during your tenure as District Attorney for Contra Costa County. My pleasure to be here, thank you. So before we get into the discussion, I first want to congratulate you on winning re-election to office. You won the June 7th primary election, 56 to 43 against your challenger. This will be your second full term. Voters in Contra Costa County have twice elected you Chief Law Enforcement Officer, but many may not know your life prior to becoming DA. So. We're going to talk a little bit about your biography first. So where were you born? Where did you grow up? Mm -hmm. How did you get interested in the law? Well, let's start with where I was born. Okay. I, I am a, a native Californian, uh, born and raised in Oakland, California, All right. uh, in East Oakland and attending East uh, um, Oakland Public Schools as well. So I think uh, I have to date myself, but I am a child of the 50s and the yeah. 60s. Yeah, yeah. And when I was growing up, it really was a, a time of many, many movements. Um, there was the civil rights movement that, uh, and so many things were happening in that arena. arena. Um, I was able to watch on TV even little Ruby Bridges as she took her uh, steps to try to integrate schools in, in New Orleans. Um, there was the Vietnam War, which was also going on. We had the gay rights movement, uh, the women's rights movement. So there were all of these movements going on. And I think even as a child, what I began to see is that um, lawyers seem to really play a significant role mm. in effectuating change, yeah. either in the courtroom by winning major court cases, but also in the legislature. And so it sort of that's where my dream was initially kindled to want to become a lawyer so that I could um, be of service and effectuate change in a good way for my community. Yeah, I think like the, the civil rights movement, I mean, just the legal groundwork that was laid not only in the 60s, but the 50s mm -hmm. uh, with Thurgood Marshall and so forth. So you're yes. right. I mean, the, the law was a powerful thing. Yes. Still is to Still this is. day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So. You were kind of, I mean, some people say, you know, you were bitten by the blank bug, whatever, <laughs> if you were into technology or media or whatever. So I guess you were bitten by the law bug early in life. I was bitten life. by the law bug early in life. <laughs> yeah. I had this dream. Never met a lawyer in my life, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'd only seen lawyers on TV watching Perry Mason. But um, I had that dream even as a little girl to were, become a lawyer. Are you the first uh, attorney in your in your family? Were you oh, the yes. First? Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> and where did you go to school? Well, I went to Oakland Public Schools. Mm -hmm. I'm a graduate of Castlemont High. Um, I then attended San Francisco State. Hey, my um, alma mater. <laughs> yes. I went there too. Yeah. Yes, and then eventually, I mean, of course, I had a few careers. I worked in finance. I worked in housing and community development. Mm -hmm. um, and then I eventually returned to uh, follow, find my dream, which was to go to law school. I went to law school at night. Uh, during that time, I worked right uh, here in the county of Contra Costa County. I used to supervise the um, housing and community um, development unit oh. uh, in uh, the city of Richmond. Okay. And I went to law school at night. And wow. At uh, Golden Gate University. Okay. So you had a very uh, full life I mean, in terms uh, of it was busy. A, not a lot of hours to sleep, really. It was a busy time. <laughs> I, yeah, during that four years, I was a night student. So... Um, Worked during the day. I even um, both of my sons were born during that period of time as well. So it was a busy time. And then I, th I guess the elephant in the room. You were a judge for twenty years. For twenty-two years. <laughs> twenty-two. I Sorry, I didn't mean to short you those two years. <laughs> I had the pleasure of really uh, pleasure of serving as a judge here in Contra Costa County. Um, and I had a, a wonderful, wonderful career. Just got to do so many wonderful things uh, and had so many assignments. I supervised the civil division. I supervised the felony uh, calendar division, which is where all of the plea bargains are made. I was eventually elected as the presiding judge, so I had the administrative responsibility uh, for the entire court. Wow. We had some tough budget years then um, because it was one of the toughest time for cutbacks in California for courts. 
but we managed to uh, steer the, the, the ship during, even during that difficult time. Mm. Uh, developing the court strategic plan, which still the mission statement still stands today. So, so really wonderful work that I had an opportunity to participate in as a judge. And then district attorney. You were appointed district attorney in 2017, right? I was, yes. I was. Um, the former district attorney, as we all know, resigned uh, having pled to felony charges. There was a, a big push uh, within our community uh, to really um, make sure that the process for selection of the next district attorney was a very open process that the entire community could participate in. Um, so I was one of 12 applicants and, he, and eventually I was selected by the Board of Supervisors. That was in 2017. And then you had to run for election. And immediately. <laughs> immediately. Well, the election was yeah. actually um, ongoing at yeah. the time that I was appointed. And I was able to, I had uh, three opponents uh, when I entered the race. Um, and I did, uh, in 2018, the people elected me. I won in the primary and then again here in 2022. Okay. Congratulations for that. Thank you. That's, that's quite a feat. Yeah. So we're going to pivot here to some big news that came at the federal level. On October 6th of this year, President Joe Biden announced that he was granting pardons to 6,500 citizens and lawful residents and thousands more mm -hmm. in the District of Columbia for prior cannabis convictions. However, two years ago, you announced that 3,264, I wanted yeah. to get that number right, yes. marijuana convictions in this county, Contra Costa County, mm -hmm. those folks that were eligible for those convictions to be dismissed under Prop 64, would their cases would be reviewed through a partnership with Code for America and the DA's office. So yes. I, I teed that up in a little complex way, but just explain what that process was. How did you partner with Code for America, or who are sure. they, and what did they do to make those dismissals, essentially, mm -hmm. easier for your mm -hmm. office? Well, when Prop 64 uh, passed, making um, possession of cer certain amounts of marijuana uh, no longer illegal, there's still a lot of people who had convictions old convictions on their records. Mm -hmm. And some people don't even know that they had convictions on their records, but what can happen is when you have those old convictions, they can keep you from um, being productive in a lot of ways, keep you from getting certain li professional licenses, uh, keep you from getting into housing or yeah. even getting into school and getting student loans. And so there's a pretty onerous process. It's, it's made much simpler now, but there's a process that people can go through to clear their records, but most people don't know about it. Uh. But with Prop 64, Code for America reached out to us, and we were one of the first counties in uh, California to say yes to Code for America and to accept their services. I'd already looked into um, of trying to figure out um, how we were going to find all of those convictions within our system. We really didn't have the people power to do it, and I'd estimated that it would probably take us probably close to a year right. to be able uh, to process all of those cases. But Code for America says that they want to make government work better for the people, and that's exactly what they're built on. So with their technological skills, they built an algorithm for us that would, could go into our system and within a matter of seconds really locate all of those convictions and organize them in a way wow. that we could then um, process them uh, expeditiously with the court. Okay, so if you didn't have technology doing that, let's say you had to assign attorneys to review these cases, mm -hmm. how long would that take? Well, like I said, we did not have the people power. Right. I had already gone to uh, our county administrator to uh, begin conversations about hiring temporary attorneys to help us with that work, and which we'd estimate it would probably take at least a year for us to be able to go into the system and find all of those. And Code for America does it in a nanosecond? In a few seconds, yes. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty yeah. impressive. So, so now, we, it was great to be able to, to partner with them and to really be a leader in California, leading the way so that other offices as well could feel comfortable to use this service. Yeah. Now I should also remind viewers that you received the inaugural Cannabis Justice Award. Now this is from the Contra Costa chapter of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. In your speech, you talked about mass incarceration um, due to the war on drugs and compared it to the post-Civil War era when 
well, in terms of sheer numbers of people that were locked up, it was similar. Mm -hmm. Mass incarceration is not only incredibly expensive, and I had read that to incarcerate someone, it's a little over $100,000 a year for taxpayers to pay for Correct. one individual. Mm -hmm. But it's also incredibly destructive and disruptive to family ties. So talk a little bit about that, about this, about cannabis convictions, mass incar incarceration, and not only the expense, but what the kind of toll it takes. You, you kind of sure. touched on that a little bit about how hard it is to find jobs, mm -hmm. get schooling, or even housing. You know, sure. These are difficult. These are, but then again, it, it does take a, a, a toll on the family. It takes a toll. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we, what we found, and I don't have those statistics right in front of right. me, is that when we look back, and, and I'm not saying that the war on drugs uh, alone contributed to mass incarceration because there were lots of things along the way sure. that um, got us to the place of being the most over-incarcerated country in the world. Um, as we have heard over and over, the uh, United States has 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's prisoners. And so that's why having the discussion about how, what we can do as prosecutors and with the um, amount of discretion that we have, how can we, within the context of community safety, try to change that conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and one of those, one, one small part of it was being able to help people clear their, their records so that they could, um, as I mentioned earlier, get um, um, jobs, um, get housing, um, and be um, productive in ways in our society. Yeah, because you think about it, if you fill out an application for a job, they're going to ask sure. you about you, any they, conviction, they might find you. and then you have to write it down. What are your chances of getting the job if you put, sure. you know, when you have to list that? Well, the law has yeah. changed so mm -hmm. that uh, you may not necessarily have to disclose that at the outset, but it still could be a barrier down the line. And as I mentioned, it's not just getting a job, getting certain licenses uh, used to be affected as well. Yeah. And so it really was a, a, a service. So we uh, were able to, um, I think it was over 3,200 convictions affecting the lives of over 2,500 people here in Contra Costa County. That's, so that's not nothing, that's right? That's pretty major yeah, work. That is pretty yeah. major. So uh, the process of getting your record clear does require effort on the part of individuals. It's, it not, it's not just, you know, push the button and make it happen. Uh, you have to do some work. So we do have a graphic from clearmyrecord.org, and this is a, a national um, mm -hmm. site that anyone can go to, but it is also localized. And on that, as you can see on the graphic there, you have to fill out an application, yes. you have to write a personal statement, you have to get three to five letters of recommendations, and this could be from bosses, clergy, uh, mm -hmm. family members, anything like that. And this is locally here, that's handled through the public defender's office. Yes. But if you just go to that site, it'll essentially get you to the Contra Costa County site, and you'll see what's required for that. Sure, yeah. sure. And that's why, actually, there's work that I actually started uh, when I was even serving as a judge, mm -hmm. partnering with a number of others in our community, not just the Public Defender's Office, but uh, Rubicon, the League of Women Voters, and we would put on these major events in the community because even with uh, the information, the graphic that you just put up, there's so many people out there who just are not aware of the process. So it's another thing that we were able to do is to take this information and actually hold large community events to inform people about how to clear their records and actually have the uh, resources on site so that people could begin the application process right there. Right there, yeah, yes. like laptops or, or mm -hmm. iPads and so yes. forth, that's great. So we're recording this. Uh, a week before the midterm elections, mm -hmm. uh, that's the 2022 midterm elections. Now, one issue that is a concern, and I've seen this in poll after poll, national, local, and that is crime with Absolutely. voters. Voters are very concerned with crime. Now, the data on violent crime really doesn't match the perception of crime. And we have mm -hmm. a graphic up here to show the federal survey that shows no increase in violent crime since the start of the pandemic. However, if you look at that very graphic that starts in 1993 and continues right up until 2021, you'll see a, a market decline in crime with some waves going up and down, little peaks here and there. Mm -hmm. But we're at a point where crime is actually, violent crime is actually relatively low. But people's perceptions of crime mm -hmm. is super high. So there's a big gap between the two. 
What do you suppose that is? Well, I think a part of it, and, and we had this conversation um, a lot as I'm out in the, in the community, mm -hmm. and what I learned is that, f one, we, we have so much information that we receive from so many sources. I mean, 24-hour news, right. it's on social media. Yeah. So every time something happens, it's broadcast many, many times. And what I learned from people is, they don't really want to hear necessarily about the data and the statistics. So if, if someone were to ask me that question and I'm in the community, what I learned is that people um, don't feel safe because we're bombarded with so much information about how crime is out of control. And so just talking about, I found that just talking about the numbers mm -hmm. and even showing the graphics that crime has, that crime has been on a steady decline is not a conversation that really um, people want to engage in. They wanted to know how, what are you doing to make me feel safe? Mm -hmm. And that's why we could then talk about, for example, we had the smash and grabs, uh, you right. know, with yeah. uh, the, the we made the national yeah. news with we Nordstrom's. We did, yeah, Contra Costa uh, County, and, Walnut Creek was um, particular. Yeah. Explaining to people that, you know, we had this really instance where 90 people went into the Nordstrom store all simultaneously to take mer merchandise and then all left at once. But out of those 90 people, three people were apprehended. And what we were able to do, those three people were charged with very serious crimes, uh, all felonies, and they're currently making their way through the court system. But immediately, um, I partnered with um, six other district attorney offices up and down the state of California, at, including the attorney general's office, because what we recognize is that the person who might be in Contra Costa County today might show up in Santa Clara County uh, tomorrow right. or, or Alameda County. So as district attorneys, we decided to pool our resources to share intelligence uh, with law enforcement to make sure that we were bringing the best tools, not only in terms of prosecuting, but also intelligence as well, uh, so that um, we could combat, use a united front to combat this type of crime. So that kind of information, I think, resonated more with our community as opposed to talking about uh, what the data shows. It's like, yeah. this is what we're actually doing to try to make sure that our community is safe. And, every, and, and assuring people that every single person that has been apprehended and brought to our office for prosecution has been prosecuted. They have been charged with very serious felony crimes and they're making their way through the court system today. So that, that Nordstrom smash and grab, that was obviously organized crime. And it happened in other yes. cities too, San Francisco. Yes. It happened in, 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 the, in um, the Los Angeles area, certainly mm -hmm. in the South Bay. So law enforcement saw probably pretty quickly, uh, this is organized crime. Yes. Therefore, we're going to have to kind of organize on a multi-level, mm -hmm. not only the AG, but other DA's, mm -hmm. DA offices to try and to combat this. And that's exactly what we did. And it has been effective. Yes, it's been very I think effective. so. Yeah. Think so, so looking specifically at Contra Costa County and looking at the stats mm -hmm. in Contra Costa County, and I know that you go out into the public a lot. You do a, a tremendous amount of outreach. You speak at a, a wide variety of, of clubs and mm -hmm. organizations. And I know we just talked about the fact that the data is one thing, but the data shows clearly violent crime in Contra Costa County which is represented by that dotted line, has been on the decline since the 1980s. In fact, it's yeah. almost leveled out. It has a, it spiked up a little bit, and we're going to show a graphic in a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have also property crimes in Contra Costa County, which, again, is trending downward. Um, this is for 2020. And a third graphic that we have up, which is on the screen now, shows violent crime rates in most of the state's 15 largest counties in 2021, there was a slight uptick. And for, sure. Cal for Contra Costa County, yes, we have seen an uptick. You look at Fresno, and that is off the charts. I know you're the district attorney that covers Fresno. Uh, but the slight uptick in Contra Costa County kind of corresponds to what's going on in other parts mm -hmm. 
not only of the state, but of the country all as well. All over the country, yeah, all really. Over the country. So, yeah, it's been interesting when you look at the, the graphics and the data. In 2020, uh, while other uh, counties in California had a, a, a huge uptick, mm -hmm. uh, not only in violent and in property crimes, we were one of uh, four counties out of the 58 where we actually had a decrease in 2020. And now in 2021, uh, we're seeing a slight uptick. Still the de decrease in property crimes, mm -hmm. but a slight uptick in the violent crimes. Crimes. One thing I didn't mention when uh, we're talking about what we're doing for community safety is, is that I also co-lead the FBI Safe Streets Task Force here in Contra Costa County. And that's an important uh, piece of, um, of being able to keep our violent uh, crime rate low mm -hmm. because that task force really concentrates on those in our community who are committing violent crimes and especially those who might be using guns and using gangs. And so we have that specialized task force that really are concentrating on those people within our county who are committing violent crimes. I think a good example of the property crimes that also has a violent component is over the summer there was a rash of high-end watches, mostly Rolexes, right. that were being stolen. Mm -hmm. I, I, because I'm your public information officer, I talk to the media a lot, and the media was asking me specifically, hey, is this part of a, a trend? Are you seeing like a big trend? And I said, at the time when I was speaking to them, I said, it's more of a crime of opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers are relatively low, but you know, these are pretty high profile type of yes. robberies. I guess they're more brazen than anything else. Mm -hmm because they're, they are actually going after, they're, they're following people either out of restaurants or to yes. their homes and so forth, mm -hmm. and sometimes robbing them at gunpoint. Yes. And uh, it's upsetting, and anytime that happens absolutely. to anybody, of course, absolutely, but because it's Rolex watches, mm -hmm. it's people uh, that have some affluence, they're, they have, you know, they're fairly wealthy, or at least they have some money, then it becomes a media story. Mm -hmm. But this is, a, I think, a good example of where the perception of crime and the mm -hmm. reality of certain types of categories of crime don't quite match up. Mm -hmm. That's not to say the emotional, you know, toll that it takes not only on the victim but the people that are watching this. Like I don't Absolutely. want that to happen to me. You know that that yeah. that's that's just as, mm -hmm. as an example of something that I'm dealing with with regards to the media because I look at the crime stats too and I'm all like, well, the data's not showing like it's mm -hmm. it's an epidemic. Mm -hmm. There were some copycat crimes, but not not to the point where you would see an, an, a, a sizable uptick in property crimes. Mm -hmm. So um, another issue on voters' minds is reproductive rights. Sure. Uh, especially in light of the Dobbs decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, you held a press conference with Attorney General Rob Bonta earlier in the month announcing a reproductive rights task force, and that was to protect the liberties of women. Uh, what are the details of this sure. task force? Um, the task force is it's really the vision of um, Attorney General Bonta, but the idea is to bring together from all over the state uh, district attorneys, those in law enforcement, city attorneys, so that we collectively um, think about and pool our resources so that we're ready, for example, for those who might come from out of state um, to um, be able to seek uh, health care here in, Cali in California. Mm -hmm. um, and that we're also making sure that we're doing everything that we can, for example, to keep our um, places where people can go safe um, so that um, they are not harassed if you're going, for example, into a Planned Parenthood office. You know, what can we do uh, up and down the state of California to protect a uh, woman and a family's right to, to choose the health care of their choice? And finally, as we wrap up, Yes. <laughs> What's on the horizon for the next term for you as district attorney? <laughs> well, there's always something new that's happening mm. at the district attorney's office. One, there are about three or four things that I'll mention, though. Okay. Um, one that we're very excited about, we just recently, within the last few months, launched our Neighborhood Restorative Partnership. And this, some people call it community courts. It's an easier right. concept to understand. But this is where people from the community, like yourselves and like the people who are watching, have an opportunity to actually train in as arbitrators using a restorative justice lens to be able to um, help us um, take care of cases, low-level nonviolent cases that happen in your own community. So it allows the community to be a part of the solution. It's victim-centered, 
because victims get to have a voice in what they think would be an appropriate outcome. People are then held accountable. They try, you as arbitrators, try to get to the root cause of the problem and then fashion a remedy that holds the person accountable, get, makes the victim whole, and also allows the community to hold be, to be made whole as well. So those applications can be uh, for people who'd like to have the time and who'd like to be trained as arbitrators to solve uh, cases within your own community. You can uh, go to our website and uh, click on the application. It really is a big help because what it does is it is a way to um, really help us to take a load off of the criminal justice system and the number of cases that we're sending through our court system mm -hmm. and still hold people accountable for what happens in our own communities. And you also have uh, a memorandum of understanding that you signed with the U.S. Department of Labor uh, that yes. has to do with wage yes. theft and, and yeah. We're now in the process of building out our uh, workplace justice unit and it is going to deal with just that. Uh, wage theft will also be dealing with labor trafficking cases there as well. So we're very excited about that work. We'll probably be producing some symposiums that we'll um, hold in conjunction with our labor partners as well as law enforcement to make sure that we're all on the same page about how to work together to solve some of those cases. And we started with data, with Code for America. We should yes. end with data because yes. we're working on a data <laughs> dashboard, right? Yes, yeah. and we are working. Uh, we have a number of ways, number of organizations that we're working with. But as you all, as you know, data is so important. It's, it will help us as we're able to utilize new resources, not only to help us internally with, with the work that we're doing, but we're also working on a data dashboard that's going to allow us to give externally to our community, people will be able to go to our website instead of calling us to say, how many cases did you prosecute last year? What kind of cases did you prosecute? They can go right to our website and be able to uh, access that kind of information. And then, of course, we're still working with the Vera Institute, helping us to take a deep dive into our uh, workloads to see where we might have uh, disparities and an un equitable treatment in our system as well. So lots of things lots. on the horizon with yeah. respect to that. You have a full term it's ahead of you. It's going to be an exciting <laughs> yeah. next few years. It yes. sure will be. <laughs> Dinah, thank you so much thank you for, for being on this time. program and yeah. talking to me and informing residents of Contra Costa County about some issues about you know, law enforcement, law, a little bit about you yes. and ending thank with you. data. Thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for the conversation. You're very welcome. <laughs> and speaking of data, for more information on getting cannabis convictions dismissed, the Clean Slate program is the place to start. Go to clearmyrecord.org to get started. This has been a Q&A with Dinah Becton, District Attorney for Contra Costa County. I'm Ted Astrogatu. Thanks for watching. Thank you.